Hello, this is Pastor Tom Loud with Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship in Seattle, Washington. And I want to thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning message. It's so good to have you. It's wonderful to have you, our friends and family around the world. We are just so happy that you can join us today. And, uh, you know, we've been forced by the COVID-19 situation to begin to put more sermons online. And that's been a real blessing, actually. We found that many people are really getting fed. And so we are glad to hear that the word is being spread. So once again, uh, I just want to thank you for your support, for your prayers, for all that you have done uh, in, in encouragement for this ministry. So right now, before we begin, I'd like to start off with a prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you that you are good, that you are on the throne, that no one, Lord Jesus, can thwart your plan, but you have a good plan for your people. Thank you, Father, that you are in control. And right now we just say, Lord, we ask for you to have your will in our lives in everything that we do and everything that we say. We want to glorify you. And we ask, Father, for those that are in need right now, that you would supply all their needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. We ask, Father, right now that you would guide and direct those that need guidance right now, that you would heal those that need healing. We just say be made whole in the name of Jesus. Everything we need comes from you, Lord, and all good things come from God, and we just praise you for it. So, God, as we begin to uh, meditate today on your word, we just ask that you would open up our spiritual ears to be able to hear and our spiritual hearts to be able to receive the seed of the word that the seed might grow and produce much fruit and we would greatly benefit from it and we would be able to spread your word to others in Jesus name amen amen so if you've never been with us before welcome if you uh, have missed any of the previous messages and would like to catch up with them you can find them online on our website shorelinefullgospel.org or you can find them right here on YouTube, on this YouTube channel, Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship. You can also find them on my YouTube channel, Tom Loud. Also on my YouTube channel, Tom Loud, you can find uh, many instructional videos for how you can walk in the things of the Spirit and begin to see the miraculous in your life and in the life of others. So once again, welcome today. And before the sermon, we're going to turn it over to my brother, Reverend Aaron Baker. Amen. Well, good morning. Once again, it's time to praise the Lord. We welcome you to join your hearts with ours and lift up our Heavenly Father and give him the praise that he so rightfully deserves. He is worthy of all the praise. And so before we begin, we will pray. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we may come before you today and honor you. And we ask you to take what we offer and bless it. Take our hearts, Lord, and fill it with your wisdom, your direction, and your power for the day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. And once again, I'd like to welcome Rolls Rawson, who's worshiping with us this morning, lending her marvelous talents. Hey. Welcome, Rose. Thank you.
you were worthy of it all.
Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that time of worship. The title of our message today is Safe Room, A Safe Room. When I was a child, the threat of nuclear war loomed over the United States. We were afraid of Russia. We were afraid of Cuba. We were even afraid of Red China. I remember in second grade practicing what they called bomb drills. A lot of good they would have done, but we practiced them. An alarm would go off at school, and we were taught to get under our desks and roll up into a tight little ball. And, and we were made ready that at the moment we heard anybody say, duck and cover, we could do that process and get under our desk and hide out. Because if a bomb went off, you know, all this uh, shrapnel and stuff and, and things falling from the ceiling, we'd be under our desk and be safe. Now... Obviously, radiation wouldn't be stopped by your desk, but they just wanted us to feel a little bit safer, I guess. Now, during that same time period, there were many people uh, that lived where I lived in Southern California who began to build bomb, uh, bomb shelters in their backyards. So they began to dig big holes in their backyards or fill in swimming pools and build bomb shelters, underground shelters that in case there was a nuclear holocaust, they could go down into their own personal bomb shelter and be safe. So fear drove them to do these things. And obviously there's a lot of bomb shelters that are still there today that have not been used ever. Um, it didn't happen. We weren't bombed by the Russians. We weren't bombed by the Cubans. We weren't bombed by the Chinese. But the fear was very, very real in those days. In more recent times, wealthy people who fear attacks or kidnappings or terrorist situations, uh, they have begun to build in their homes things called safe rooms. These are hidden rooms within their house that are, have, are secured like a safe. Like a, like a vault in a, in a bank, for example. And they are secured and they are uh, self-contained and they have um, their own generating of electricity. They have their own food sources and all this to keep the bad guys out if you have to go there and resort to that to get away. So you have a safe room in your house. That is what people do to protect themselves. They do what they know to do. Now, the truth of the matter is this. We find in Psalms 127.1, here's the facts. Unless the Lord builds the house, those that build it labor in vain. And listen to this. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And what that scripture is saying is this, is you can prepare all of your protection and all of your supplies and all of your needs, but if the Lord is not in it, you're wasting your time. The world doesn't realize that truth, but we believers should understand that. Proverbs 18.10, this is where our mindsets should be. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. So where does the world go when it's in danger? Well, a better question is for you as a believer, where do you go? Where do you go? Let's look at Psalms 27, 4 through 5. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For, listen to this, for in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me upon a rock. For the believer, we put all of our trust in God, not in our gun collection, not in our bomb shelters in the backyard, not in our safe rooms. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says this, But blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He is like a tree planted by the waters that sends out its roots towards the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes, and its leaves are always green. It does not worry in the year of drought, nor does it cease to produce fruit. So I want to ask you this question. Do you trust in politicians to protect you? Do you trust in the police to protect you? Do you trust in your riches to provide protection for you? 
Do you trust in your weapons to protect you? Here's what the word says about that, putting your trust in those things. Psalms 20, verses 7 through 9. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise up again and stand firm. O oh Lord, save the king. Answer us this day we call. Also, Proverbs 18, 28. He who trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like foliage. Our trust is not in things. Our trust is not in man. Our trust is not in governments or systems. Our trust is in the Lord. A lot of us trust news sources. We trust information that we are given. I want you to know this. There's a lot of information that is given. You can find it on the internet. You can find it on your news channel. You can find it in a newspaper and in magazines. There's all kinds of ways to communicate. But I want you to know this. Information is not the same as knowledge. Knowledge is always true. It really isn't knowledge if it's theory, if it's conjecture, or if it's falsehood. It's only knowledge when it is actually known. And so if it needs to be known to actually be called knowledge, then let me tell you this. God is the only source of knowledge because he never theorizes. He never guesses. He never figures it out wrong, but he actually knows. God knows all things. He's the all-knowing God. He's omniscient, means he knows everything. You want to go to the source of the one who knows what he's talking about. You go to the scriptures. The scriptures tell us the truth. And that truth comes from the mouth of God. And that truth is undeniable. It's accurate and it's trustworthy. Information is only as dependable as the source that is behind it. If the devil wrote a newspaper, would you read it? I wouldn't. If the devil broadcasted news, would you watch it? I wouldn't. In fact, he does. <laughs> if an atheist taught theology, would you believe in it? If a fool taught wisdom, would you follow his directions? Well, those are foolish questions, aren't they? What if there was only one reliable source of truth and all others were questionable? Some sources, in fact, were used by your enemy to misinform you and to deceive you and to manipulate you. Others were perhaps well-meaning sources by people who really cared and wanted to do right, but their facts were wrong because they did not know the truth. Some were from those who truly thought they understood, but they were not working with a sound mind. There's all kinds of people out there giving forth information, and you have to know what to believe. But what if there really was only one source of truth that was never, ever wrong? What if this source of truth had been tested by millions of people for thousands of years and never found to be wrong, not even once? And what if that source often contradicted the information that was coming from every other source, even when all these other sources agreed with each other? Which source would you believe? And what if you didn't know all the facts to everything, but you did know the one who does know all the facts? Would you continue to listen to the other sources? Of course, you're saying no. Well, then why do you? Why do you listen to the other sources? Would you continue to make your life decisions based on the information supplied by sources other than God's word, other than God's spirit? Well, then why do you? And what if God came down himself in person and told us which source was the only source of truth so that we didn't have to guess, so we didn't have to wonder. Well, he did. John 17, 16. Our Father in heaven sent us Jesus, the Word made flesh. It says this in John 17, 16 through 19. They are not of this world, Jesus is praying, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. Jesus says, Father, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified by the truth. So Jesus told those who were listening on as he's praying, 
he said that we were sanctified by truth and that he sanctified us himself by truth. And this word sanctification means we've been set apart by God for God's purposes. And it is the truth that we know in our hearts that sets us apart because the rest of the world believes all the other stuff they hear. His word has never failed. His word is truth. That's what Jesus said. Thy word, O Lord, is truth. Joshua 21, 44 through 45 says this, and the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. None of their enemies could stand against them, for the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel had failed. Everything was fulfilled. Did you get that? Not one of the Lord's promises failed. Everything he said was fulfilled. You can count on God's word. When God says it, you can count on it. What God has promised to you and I as believers, we have put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Those promises will never be unfulfilled, but they will all be brought to pass. His word is a solid rock to build your life upon, and his word never shifts. It never changes. It never fails. His word is sure. It's secure. It's dependable. It can be counted on. It is the only safe place to run to. Psalms 119, 89. Through 90 says it's forever O Lord your word is settled in heaven your faithfulness is to all generations you have established the earth and it stays his word is settled in heaven that means it's a done deal it can't be undone and it is without question whatever God has said is without question it is truth do you want a safe place to hide in times of trouble there's only one truly safe place where where can you hide in the times of trouble is it going to be in your safe room? Is it going to be in your underground bunker? Where are you going to hide? Is it going to be in uh, something provided by your government? Where are you going to hide? Psalms 91 is a beautiful psalm that speaks to those who put their trust in the Lord. It says this, he who dwells, that means you live in the secret place of the Most High. You see, this is a safe room, the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Under his shadow means you're under his protection. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and he is my fortress. God is your refuge and your fortress in times of trouble. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And the fowler in this case represents the traps of the enemy. God will surely deliver those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High from the traps of the enemy and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under your wings you will take refuge. Under his wings you'll take refuge. His truth shall be your shield. His truth is the one that protects you. That's the thing that protects you and is your buckler. You shall not be afraid by the terror by night nor by the arrow that flies by day. People who depend on the news media to give them comfort, that's the very thing that is causing them terror by night and terror by day. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. There are things that are happened that are beyond your vision and you can worry about the things you don't know about as well as the things you do know about. But those that put their trust in the Lord don't have to worry about those things. Nor of the destruction that lays waste at the noonday. You know what, stuff happens around the world, but God has you under his wings. It says this, a thousand may fall at your side. You know, that could be close. That could be next door neighbors. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. That seems very close, but he promises us this, but it shall not come near to you. You hear that? God is your protector. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. No matter what man plans against you, God shall put a heavenly entourage around you to protect you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. And the Lord saying, because you've set your love on him, he will deliver you. I will set him on high because he has known my name. What's his name? His name is Jesus. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Listen to what that just said. 
I will be with him in trouble. You know, there was a fourth man in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew boys. He was with them in the furnace. He didn't take them out of the furnace. He brought them through the furnace. And when they came out the other side, they didn't even smell a smoke. So know this, you may be in trouble, but God is with you in the trouble and protecting you. I will deliver him and I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now that's a beautiful promise of God. So if you're a true believer, then you're a God's child. And if you're a God's child, then all the promises that he has given to his children belong to you. And if all the promises have been given to you and to me, then why do we live just like the world who cannot claim any of these promises? We live just like them many times. Why do we fear like they fear? Why do we? Why do we doubt like they doubt? Why do we react like they react? Something is obviously wrong. There's a disconnect somewhere, but where is it? I think that we often forget who we are, who we are now. And we tend to live the life we used to live before we were born again. We still see ourselves as that old person and not as the new creation in Christ Jesus, who has the promises of God, who is a joint heir with Christ. We were born in sin a long time ago, born in a natural world, and we suffered from living a life apart from God. That was empty. That was distant. That was spiritually dead, but that's not who we are now. It was a life of hopelessness. It was a life of slavery to sin and an uncertain and frightening future, but that was then. That should not affect us now. We have a new reality now. We have been given a new life. We've been given a new identity. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We have been set free from the power of sin and from the power of the enemy, and we have been cleansed from all unrighteousness, but the job has only partially been completed up until this time. Because even though we are new creations in the spirit, and we've received the down payment, the earnest of God's promises, which is his Holy Spirit who lives within us, there's still some things that we're waiting for that haven't been delivered yet, you could say. We are saved, we're spiritually alive, but here's the facts. We still live in this world, don't we? We still have to deal with this world. And we still inhabit these mortal bodies, don't we? These bodies that are subject to death. But those who truly believe in Jesus know that we look forward to a day where we will no longer live in this fallen world and we will no longer dwell in these mortal bodies. But we will live with the Lord forever in heaven where there is no evil, there's no sin, there's no sickness, there's no sorrow, there's no death where we will have a new kind of a body, a resurrected body, an eternal body that will not age, it will not weaken, it will not become sick, it will not die, it will live forever. But where are we at right now? We are new creations, yes, that are presently living in a fallen world, that's true, and in earthly bodies of flesh, but sometimes we forget who we really are, which is our spirit man, the new man. That's who we really are, and that's on the inside. We forget that though we look the same on the outside, on the inside we're entirely different. Too often we take our eyes off of the things of the spirit, and we focus on the things of the flesh and of the earth, and we live as if nothing has changed and nothing's different from when we were born into this world. We let our natural mind and our physical bodies take control of our lives just like they used to have. But I want to wake you up. It's time for God's children to open their eyes. It's time for us to all look at the things that God is showing us in his word, which is the only source of truth. And through the eyes of the spirit, which God has planted within us, is his spirit. It's time for us to push the veil of the flesh aside and begin living in the spirit as the new man that we indeed are. Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24 say this, But this is not the way you came to know Christ. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him, in keeping with the truth that is in Jesus, to put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We need to wake up and say, wait, 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 wait. The old man has tried to come back and tried to, to order our life and to make our decisions. No, no, put that off. Put that off and put on the new man. Our problem is that we are not supposed to see like the world sees because they're still in the old man. We're not supposed to believe like the world believes because they're still in the old man. They're still in their fallen state. We're not to be led by what leads the world, driven by what drives the world. 
believing what the world believes, but we are in the world, but the Bible says clearly, but we're not of this world. We need to begin to live the truth out in our lives in such a way that people can see that we are living epistles to God. We are showing that when you look at me, you can see the life of Christ being lived out in a human being. We're not just, just to memorize God's word, but we are to live God's word. We are to model God's word before the eyes of the world because the world is watching and they want to see what this Jesus in you can do. We can't walk in the flesh and please God. Understand that. As long as we walk in the flesh, we won't please God. It is my desire to please God. I'm sure that's your desire too. We cannot continue to live like the world and expect to experience God's new creation, love, joy, and peace that the world doesn't even have. When you live like the world, <laughs> your experience of life will be just like the world's experience. It's time for God's people to choose to walk after the Spirit and not be led by our flesh or by the things that the world follows. Romans 8, 5 says this, those who live according to the flesh or the dictates of the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. What is your mind set on? I, I don't mean what do you occasionally think about, but what is your mind actually fixed upon? Is it on God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit or is it on the news and the things of this world? Romans 8, 6 says this, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. If you have no peace, could it be because your mind is operating in the flesh and not in the spirit? Romans 8, verse 7, because the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The mind led by the flesh is hostile towards God. It doesn't want to listen to God. It doesn't want to obey his word. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to study the word. It doesn't want to do anything but please the lust of the flesh. Now, the eighth verse in Romans 8, those who are controlled by the flesh cannot please God. It didn't say they might not please God. It says they cannot please God. Do you realize that as a new creation, you cannot experience the pleasures of this new life you have in Christ, let alone give God pleasure in your life if you're controlled by the flesh? So if you're controlled by the flesh, even if you're a Christian, in every way you're displeasing to yourself and to God. Now Romans 8, the ninth verse, you have, however, are not controlled by the flesh, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. Who was Paul addressing in this letter? Well, it appears to be somebody who was actually walking in the spirit because he says this, you, however, are controlled not by the flesh, but by the spirit. But is that true for you? Is that true for me? Tenth verse in Romans 8, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead. Now, this word dead does not actually mean that your body is dead as we picture being dead, but actually the word is better translated, your body is mortal and it is subject to death. So in this body, this body is temporary. This body is subject to death. We understand that this body is not going to live forever. And it says this, and once again, it says this, verse 10, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And the 11th verse, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised, raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And this is talking about the day that this body is changed, is transformed into an eternal body. But right now we know this body is subject to death. 12th verse in Romans 8, therefore brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, because that's the end of it. <laughs> you don't have eternal life if you're just going to follow your whole life after the flesh. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 14th verse, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you a son of God? Are you a son of God, and yet you're not led by the Spirit? The Bible says, if you're a son of God, you are led by the Spirit. In fact, this is something that proves that you're a son of God. You're led by the Spirit. 15th verse, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear. If you have all the same fears the world has because of all the things going on in the world, then you're not walking after the spirit. Does thinking on the things of this world, the news media and all the stuff that is put forth to you, does thinking on that bring you fear? If so, that's not for you because that's not who you are any longer. You're not of this world. 
says this in verse 15 also, but you receive the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 16th verse, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's good news that we're God's children. NBC's not good news. CNN's not good news. But the Holy Spirit reports this. You are God's child if his spirit is in you and you're led by his spirit. 17th verse in Romans 8. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So we are Christ's heirs right now, already in this time period, even on this earth. We've already inherited everything that Christ has because Christ already died and the heirs to the estate have already received the inheritance. But it does go on to say something else. It says this, that we who are heirs will suffer with him. What kind of suffering are you asking? Well, it's not talking about spiritual suffering because we're spiritually free. We're spiritually whole. It's talking about a different kind of suffering that you must suffer if you're a son of God. And what that is talking about is this, putting your flesh through the suffering of not being in control and not being able to satisfy every lust. You're putting your flesh under subjection and your flesh will cry about that. Your flesh will suffer. Your flesh will have to understand when you say no, no means your flesh will not have its way. It's so used to having its way. Well, when it doesn't get its way, it's going to feel like it's suffering. You're putting to death the deeds of the flesh when you do that. So what's it going to be? Which life will you choose to live? The life dictated to you by the world and your flesh, a life of fear and bondage, or the life of the Spirit of God, full of love, joy, power, peace in the Holy Spirit. The choice is really yours. So what have you chosen to do? I don't know about you, but... The Bible talks about whatsoever things are of good report, whatsoever things are pure. Think on these things. The Bible never says think on all the horrible, terrible, nasty stuff that's on the news. It says think about these good things. Why? Because when you think about the problems of the world and you meditate on the problems of the world, they begin to overtake you with fear. You begin to get overtaken by fear. And God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. So how can we escape this fear? You need to run to the safe place, the safe place, the safe room. Where is the safe room? Well, the righteous believe in the name of the Lord and they run into that high tower that is the name of the Lord. And it says, and they are made safe. The righteous dwell in the secret place of the most high under the shadow of the almighty. And he covers us with his feathers and he protects us. The righteous put their trust in the Lord. They don't put their trust in chariots. They don't put their trust in riches. They don't put their trust in their weapons, in their armies, in their own power, in their own strength. They put their trust in the Lord. The righteous do not believe everything that is said and do not accept every report, but the righteous receive the report that was given by the Holy Spirit through God's word. What are you going to do? Which life are you going to live? You might think, oh, this is living some kind of Pollyanna life where we're dismissing realities. You know what? What is reality? Reality is whatever God says it is. Because everything we see in this world is temporary. Everything we see in this world is so full of deceptions. It's so full of delusions and illusions. But the things that God speaks of are eternal. They are fact. They are true. You can take them to the bank. You can build your life upon them. They're a foundation that is unshakable. The word of God, the word of God, the word of God. Which report are you receiving the most each day? Is it what the word of God says about those who are the heirs of salvation, those that are God's children? Or is it what the world says about how everything is going to hell in a handbasket? Which thing do you focus on? When you focus on the words that the world has to say, they are death. Which thing are you being led by? Are you being led by your flesh? by the fears of the flesh, by the desires and the lusts of the flesh. It says if you do, you won't be in the spirit. And if you're led by the spirit, you won't be in the flesh. And it says this, that those that are led by the flesh, that life leads to death. But those that are led in the spirit, that life leads to life eternal. It leads to joy. It leads to the kingdom. It leads to peace, love, and all the things that God has provided for those that trust in him. Which life do you want to live? 
I know which life I want to live. You see, just because you can't see something with your natural eyes doesn't mean it's not real. We can't see germs and everybody's freaked out about the COVID virus. Well, you can't see them, but they're real. You can't see nuclear energy, but it's real. You can't see certain uh, um, radio waves through the air, but they're real. Well, you know what? You can't see right now that you're surrounded by a great company of angels that has been sent to protect you. You can't see right now that God is looking upon you right now, that God is in you right now. You can't see these things, but these things are more real than anything you can touch on this earth. Begin to put your trust in the one that is eternal. Begin to put your trust in the only one that can provide safety for you. Begin to run to the Lord who is your strong tower and put your trust in him. Because when you put your trust in him, it means this, you can't put your trust in two things that are different. If they oppose each other, you can't put your trust in both of them. You have to put your trust in, I believe this or I believe that. When you put your trust in the Lord, you take your trust away from the world and therefore, you are no longer invested in that world's reality. You're invested in God's reality. And in God's reality, you can walk in the kingdom and you can walk in joy and you can walk in love and you can walk in peace and you can walk in power. The world is powerless. The world is a victim. The world is in fear. The world is in bondage. The world is in sin. The world is hopeless. But in Christ, none of that is true. In Christ, you are mighty. You are more than a conqueror. You're more than enough. In Christ, he supplies all your needs according to his riches and glory, and you lack for nothing. In Christ, by his stripes, you are healed, and no sickness or disease can come near you. In Christ, you have the fullness of God living inside of you right now, and you lack for nothing. Which life are you going to live? You really want to be safe? It's not by running to the world. It's by running to Christ. So I want to just leave that with you today. I hope that this has encouraged you and that this blesses you. God bless you. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to my wife for a closing prayer. Amen. Good morning, church family. And good morning to all of our extended family and friends that are visiting us on YouTube or through YouTube today. Um, before we go ahead and close in prayer, I thought I'd share with you a scripture that was on my heart, and that is Lamentations 3.22. And it says, though the Lord's mercies, excuse me, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, Henry is really resonating with this today. I wanted to just let you know that it's only because of God's mercy, love, and tender care that we don't get swept away by all the different things that the world is taken by. Uh, it's through his great compassion, which never fails, and his love and his faithfulness that we're able to stand. And one thing that really resonated with me is that God is faithful. He abides faithful because that's his nature. Even when we have been faithless or unfaithful, he remains faithful a God who is faithful to us. He is that faithful husband to the backsliding wife. I'm so grateful, aren't you, that Jesus, while we were yet in our sins, that Christ died for us. I'm so grateful that he is faithful. I'm so grateful that his compassions and his mercy never fails. God is so good and love never fails and that's his very nature. So with that thought in mind, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, I thank you this day for everyone that has joined us through YouTube or are with us in person. Lord, I just pray that you meet every need and reveal yourself to each and every one as the faithful God whose love and compassion never fails no matter the circumstance. Help your people, Lord, to remember how much you love them and to not allow the fear and the conspiracy theories and all the different things that would threaten to lead people astray or cause them to be panicky, Lord. Let them not be swept away by those things because of your overshadowing love and care for them. 
Lord, I just pray that you meet every need that's out there, everyone that's been ill. Father, everyone that has a financial need or a family need, Lord, I just pray that you meet those needs right now in Jesus' name. And Father, protect each and every one from the virus and from any other sickness or disease that's out there. Thank you, Father, that you're a God that heals, a God who loves, and that you're a God who is faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us.